So I'm really happy to be here, and uh, the Manson family is quite compelling. In a lot of ways, I ponder it. You know, this was, the trial was 40, nearly 46 years ago. I mean, the, uh, when the murders were, the trial was 45 years ago. And it's still a compelling subject. I did some guest lecturing at the University of Buenos Aires this uh, past September, and the uh, faculty said, can you talk to us about Clan Manson, which is what they called it. And so I actually did a talk on the Charles Manson family at the University of Buenos Aires Psychology Department. I had a translator with me. My Spanish isn't good enough to, isn't fluent enough to talk about it. But it was interesting to me that I was talking to a room full of faculty, and, a, and most of the people in the room actually were just students. So I was looking at 20, 21 year old students, 19 years old, and they all knew who Charles Manson was. And, uh, I defy anybody here to tell me the name of a famous Argentinian criminal. <laughs> um, what's interesting about, well, I'll get to it in a minute. Uh, let's start off. This, I'm going to show a short clip. It's only a few minutes long. This was actually filmed while the trial was going on. Not all of the Manson family were arrested, of course. Uh, two of the people in this film, lit, this little clip, later were. And I always say when I show this clip uh, is look at their eyes. Everything they are saying is stuff that's been indoctrinated in them by Charles Manson and watch their eyes as they're talking. Charlie has all fear. Everybody has given their fear to Charlie. You have to make love with them. That's Squeaky Fromm, who later tried to kill President Ford. You have Ford. to know it. Uh, you have to know every part of it. And to know you know it is to know it. So that you can pick it up any second and shoot. Mm. Everybody is afraid of death. And that's what's holding things up. Nobody's content right now with the world they've created, yet their minds are all mocked by a fear of death. Aren't you worried about the police? If you want it, here it is. Come and get it. It's <laughs> better hurry. Because it won't be here long, you motherfucker. Okay. Just a little <laughs> preview of what we've got in store tonight. Uh -huh. Out of respect for the people who are murdered, I wanted to start off just kind of silently, <clears throat> almost silently showing their, their faces. This was Gary Hinman. Um, he actually thought the Manson family were his friends. He was terribly mistaken. Stephen Parent, 18-year-old kid, just graduated from high school. Uh, a few weeks before he, <clears throat> he was all scheduled to enter community college, he was murdered about two weeks before um, his college classes started. Sharon Tate, of course, the movie star, married to Roman Polanski, the pedophile. <laughs> um, uh, she was nine months pregnant when she was murdered. Abigail Folger was an heiress of the Folger Coffee uh, fortune. She was a close friend of Sharon Tate. She was staying at Sharon Tate's house, helping her you know, through the late stages of her pregnancy, while Roman Polanski was in Europe making a film. Wojciech Frykowski was a Polish dissident, uh, got political asylum in the United States for his outspoken criticism of the communist government in Poland. Jay Sebring, he was the, called the hairstylist of the stars. Of all things, uh, Paul Newman said that Jay Sebring was the one who kept him from going bald. And he'd been uh, Sharon Tate's lover for a long time before she met Polanski. They stayed good friends. He was staying there as well, just as a, just as a friend. And Lino and Rosemary LaBianca, uh, he owned a small chain of supermarkets, grocery stores, and Shorty Shea. Shorty Shea was uh, a ranch hand at the Span Ranch, Spawn Ranch, which I'll talk about in a bit, and he was uh, an extra in the movies, a stuntman. And he did not like the Manson family at all. And they did not like him. And of course, there he is, Charles Manson. Interesting, just uh, tangentially, if you, if you were inclined to do this, I find it kind of, 
compelling in a revolting sort of way. But if you were to go onto a Amazon and type Charles Manson, it's amazing the kind of things you can buy. Charles Manson t-shirts, cups, uh, hmm. just you name it. He's become kind of an iconic figure in a really revolting way. And here he is in 1949 at the age of 14. He'd been arrested. By the time this photograph was taken at age 14, he was only a, about five foot two. Uh, he's a very short guy. Uh, by the time this was taken, he'd done numerous armed robberies, assaults. He'd raped a younger boy in a juvenile detention home. He'd stolen cars. And I find this interesting because the judge had compassion for him. Instead of putting him in, in a, a youth prison, a youth jail, he actually referred him to Boys Town. <clears throat> and uh, so this was actually a photograph in the Indianapolis newspaper, and it said, Boyd leaves a sinful home for new life in Boys Town. You may know uh, that Boys Town was founded by a Catholic priest, Father Flanagan, who was actually alive at this time, <clears throat> who was famous for having said, there is no such thing as a bad boy, but he had never met Charles Manson. <laughs> Manson lasted just a few days at Boys Town before he absconded at AWOL and took off again and went back to his life of crime. Uh, interesting about his background is he was uh, an illegitimate child of a young teenager. I believe she was 15 years old. Uh, he was born in Cincinnati. She was from Kentucky, Appalachia. Uh, she said that the father was a Colonel Manson in Kentucky, Colonel being an honorary title, actually he wasn't in the military. He denied paternity, but he did, Charles did get her, his name. And he was passed from relative to relative as a child. He had a rough childhood. That's, of course, no excuse for his ultimate actions. But he got kind of passed from one to the other, never stayed in school very long, and he was always getting in trouble. In 1956, as you could see, he got married, he moved to California, the land of opportunity in the mid-50s, just like my parents did, actually. But he drove a stolen car across the state lines. My parents did not. Of course, he got arrested, and uh, his wife divorced him. He got out of prison about a year and a half later, not a big deal. He was a psychopath. He supported himself by turning a 16-year-old girl, runaway girl, into, into a prostitute. He would troll for them in the bus stations. Uh, then he was rearrested for forging a U.S. treasure check, which is a federal crime. That's serious business. However, um, his, uh, the young girl that he would had working as a prostitute appeared in court and said that she was pregnant and that if the judge didn't put Charles Manson in jail, didn't send him to prison, he was going to marry her and get her get a regular job, so the judge put him out on parole. Oh. Of course, he absconded immediately. <laughs> Took off, <clears throat> got arrested in Texas. He had a couple more girls working for him. These are all runaways. And that judge was a little less sympathetic to the one in Los Angeles. And he was sent to McNeil Island Federal Prison for the stolen treasury check. Federal crime is a federal prison in Washington State. And he served a 10-year sentence there. And that was really where he perfected his art. There's a picture of him in 1956. And, uh, Interesting is while he was in prison, he had very little education. He wasn't a stupid man. He was an intelligent man. I was just discussing with this gentleman earlier. But he, he had essentially a second grade education. So <clears throat> if you were curious and went online, you could probably find letters that Charles Manson has written. Uh, punctuation is horrible. Spelling is horrible. But while he was there, he took up the, car, uh, the guitar. And this is the man who taught him how to play the guitar. And this was Alvin Karpus, a very famous, like, uh, 10 most wanted men in the uh, 1930s. He was part of the Ma Barker gang. So it's like, you know, Sheldon's not here, but his mentor is James Randi. Margaret Singer was mine. Alvin Karpus was Charles Manson. We learned from the masters, right? And he learned how to play the guitar, and he became really fanatical about it. He would practice for hours and hours and hours, and he stayed very busy in prison. He studied Scientology. He was just picking up bits and pieces. He studied hypnotism and magic. Um, anything he could find, really, that would make him more powerful in his mind. And in the meantime, he kept... Yes? And how did Winfrey's influence people? 
How to win friends and influence people. Yes. He, loved, he, he did study that one too, that's true. But I was focusing maybe a little more on, on his malevolent influences. <laughs> <laughs> but while he was there... He used the principles in that book. Yep. Uh, we, for him. They, that, uh, I read the Charles Manson book, but the, uh, the Carnegie book wasn't a primary influence on him. He used it because he was always looking for ways he could control people, and that was one of the books he read. You're absolutely true, correct in that. But while he was in prison, he practiced guitar continually, and by the time he paroled in 1967, he'd written about 150 songs, which he thought were pretty good, and he thought he could sell them for a lot of money in Los Angeles, where the music industry on the West Coast was. So he was paroled to L.A. in 1967, but Manson wasn't a stupid man, and he was paying attention to what was going on outside of the prison, and he realized <coughs> San Francisco, for somebody who, <coughs> who was used to conning and manipulating people, used to prostituting runaway girls, San Francisco was the right place to be, so he told his parole officer that he had a job offer in Berkeley, and his parole was transferred to Berkeley just in time for the summer of love in San Francisco, which Manson knew about. I find it a little disconcerting when I'm looking at this photograph, because I was part of this era, to realize that everybody in this photograph is 70 years old. Oh. <laughs> Some of us are older. <laughs> well, some of us are older, okay. 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 Everybody in this photograph is at least 70 years old. How's that? I should be, I'm a skeptic's crowd. I'm sorry. Thank you for that correction. <laughs> but let's look at a sample of the Manson Girls because vulnerability was the key for him. As I talked about this and I taught the Manson as a case study in a doctor course I taught on undue influence. There were probably 200 young people who went through the Manson family. Some of them realized that he was just a bad guy and they left. But he kicked a lot of them out because they weren't vulnerable enough. They still had too much um, self-confidence. They, they didn't have low self-esteem. These are the things he was really looking for because he was looking for vulnerable, emotionally damaged people. Now this is an interest. This is Mary Bruner. It was his first recruit, and her story is quite. Oh, well, they're all poignant, but I think of hers as a, as as tragic. Well, they all are, but hers troubles me a lot because she was um, graduated from the University of Wisconsin, moved to Berkeley, got a job at the UC Berkeley Library. She didn't have any friends here. She was a very timid, kind of hunched over young woman didn't have a boyfriend, just timid, and she would eat her lunch, if I'm in the way, I can, am I in your way? Okay. She would eat her lunch in the same place. I actually drove over there, I, I'm pretty sure I know where it is, this grassy area near the, the UC library, and every day she would sit there, you can picture her kind of furtively sitting there eating her sack lunch, not really making eye contact with anybody because she's timid and insecure, doesn't have any social support in California. But Manson had seen her there day after day after day <clears throat> because he put himself out as the, as just a peaceful hippie troubadour. You know, he grew his hair long, he carried a guitar strapped on his back, and he saw her for several days in a row. And one day he walked up to her and he said, you are the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life and you're beautiful on the outside and you're beautiful on the inside. Nobody had ever said that to Mary Bruner before and she was struck by him. Uh, Manson went back, followed her, went back to her apartment. A couple weeks later, she quit her job without bothering to pick up her final paycheck. She sold her piano. Uh, they bought a Volkswagen bus, and she and Charlie hit the road. Squeaky Fromm, we just saw her talking about how you got to make love to a gun. Of course, she is the one who tried to assassinate President Ford. Incidentally, she's out on parole because trying to kill the president is a federal crime, and she met all the criteria for parole, so she's actually living free in Texas somewhere. Squeaky Fromm didn't get along with her parents. She was clearly a troubled, disturbed young woman. She was sitting on the sidewalk, crying, sobbing her, sobbing her heart out. Manson was driving by. He saw her. He went over and he talked to her for like an hour. Um, that's all it took. She got into the Volkswagen bus with him, and she became another member of the family. Diana Lake, 
you know, where is Child Protective Services when we need them, right? Because I'll tell you about Diana Lake. She was 13 years old. Her parents were what was called free spirits. Um, there are other terms we could use, irresponsible parents, uh, <laughs> deadbeats. A lot of words come to mind, but they were living in a commune. And by the time she was 13 years old, she'd had sex numerous times. She'd taken every drug you can imagine. And Manson was staying there, and, and he was struck by her. It was the right age for him, teen, young teenagers. It's worth pointing out, incidentally, that the vast majority of the Manson family were between the ages of 13 and 19 years old. So we picture the Manson family as this malevolent, mafioso, evil group. They were children. <clears throat> and it's worth pointing out, too, that people he was recruiting from were children. I, I was very much a part of that, of that scene when I was very young. And, <coughs> And it, a couple of years ago, I drove up to see an old friend of mine in Oregon, on the Oregon coast. And uh, while I drove up there, I passed two hitchhikers. It was actually the same one, because I stopped for lunch halfway up there, and I guess the guy got a ride. And so several miles down the road, he was there. Uh, although I swore when I was a hitchhiker, I would pick up everyone I saw. I did not pick him up. But anyway, I mentioned that because I can remember hitchhiking up that way in 1970. It was 1970. And without any hyperbole at all, you would have seen 200 people hitchhiking between San Francisco and the Oregon border. There was this mass movement of young people, and really, they were, we were just children, really. We were children looking for something better. And it was from this pool of lost children that Manson Drew created his family. Diana Lake was 13 years old. He talked to the parents and said, hey, you know, I'm going down to LA. I'm going to start a commune there. Can she come with me? The parents said, well, she's a free spirit. She can go with you if she wants to. She's 13 years old. And I was an altar boy when I was 13. So I'm trying to fathom that, that the parents would allow it. But they did, and she went with them as well. Because she was so young and immature, she had difficulty following his directions because he was very authoritarian, so she got beat up more than the other people in the family because she was just a kid and she couldn't understand what he was telling her to do. Now there's an interesting story, Ruth Ann Morehouse, <coughs> she was called Snake for reasons that I don't really need to get into, but the, an odd story, there's a lot of strange people in this world and Manson was one of them, but he tended to meet a lot of them and he was hitchhiking from Berkeley <coughs> We're in Berkeley now, right? We're still in Berkeley. We're, we're, yeah. we're in Oakland now. Okay. We're in Berkeley. Okay. He hitchhiked from Berkeley. He got picked up by an essentially an itinerant preacher. He didn't have his own congregation. What would happen is if you got a, a fundamentalist church where the minister wanted to take a sabbatical, take a few months off or whatever, they could call Reverend Morehouse and he'd cover for the person. And he was living in San Jose and he picked up Charles Manson and brought him home and gave him a meal. And, um, and then after the meal, of course, he preached. That was his job, right? And uh, Manson said, now, you've heard, <clears throat> I've heard about your religion. Now you have to try my religion. And for reasons that I'll never understand, Reverend Morehouse went along with it. Charles Manson gave him LSD. He took it. He kind of went nuts. And while Reverend Morehouse was totally out of his mind, Manson grabbed Ruth Ann, who was 14 years old, and they hit the road for Los Angeles. Leslie Van Houten, a uh, tragic case, as all of them are. Uh, she'd been an honor student, what we would have called four O's when I went to high school. Uh, but a couple of bad things happened to her. And uh, one was that her parents divorced, and that devastated her. Then she had a boyfriend who was also one of the popular kids, and he got her pregnant. And she was 16 years old, mid-1960s, before Roe Wade. And he said, well, that was really stupid of you, Leslie. It was your mistake. It's not my problem. And he walked away from her. So he, she told her mother. Her mother arranged for her to get an illegal abortion, which she did not want. Um, it was totally illegal then. And she slipped into a deep depression. Her grades plummeted. She'd been like a prom princess, and all of a sudden this dropped, her grades went down, she started to hang out with the kids who hang out. Actually, when I was in high school, they hung out behind the gym and smoked cigarettes, but I went to a Catholic school, so that was about as radical as they could get, but she was hanging out with kind of the rowdy, ne'er-do-well kids. 
Um, grades got worse and worse. She got a new boyfriend. She barely got out of high school, squeaked through. Her new boyfriend, who she was madly in love with, um, he moved to a religious community, and while they were there, he decided he was going to become a priest in that community and take a vow of celibacy. So she was kind of stuck. She was 18 years old, suffering from severe major depression, has been verified over and over again in her parole hearings. I've actually worked on her uh, parole hearings a couple of times, so I'm very familiar with this case. She's a wonderful person. She's a friend. And she was drifting. She was, by the standards of America, this is a mugshot. It doesn't do her justice, but by the standards of American culture, she was a remarkably attractive young woman, and she just started hitting the road. She was depressed, had no self-esteem. She was going to the different communes. <clears throat> but of course, the guys in the communes were glad to see this young, pretty 18-year-old girl show up. They'd have sex with her. The women in the commune didn't want anything to do with her because she was threatening, so she could stay at a commune for a while, then she'd get kicked out, and she'd get booted from one to one, and she ended up sleeping on a floor in a crash pad over in Haight-Ashbury. And there was another woman that's there, and uh, she said, you know, you should come down to Southern California and join us. I belong to this wonderful commune. Um, we're peaceful vegetarians. All the women do is embroider and take care of babies. Now, that doesn't sound like a very pretty picture to me, but to <laughs> an 18-year-old hippie woman with very low self-esteem and no social support at all, that sounded pretty good. As it happened, that peaceful vegetarian commune was the Charles Manson family. And Manson would often send uh, members of his group that he particularly trusted out into forays into as far north as Mendocino, just looking for prospective recruits. So what were his influences? Well, he had a lot of them. Uh, intelligent man, uh, as this fine gentleman pointed out to me, you know, he had a couple of IQ tests that showed the second one as an adult showed he was, had a very IQ, high IQ. I'm a clinical psychologist. I do a lot of psych testing. I really doubt that seriously. I would want to see the test and I would want to know who administered it. He was an intelligent man, certainly not a brilliant man, but he was a hustler. He was clever. He was very good at what he did because he was a psychopath. He had no empathy for anybody else. This was a very popular book in the late 60s, early 70s. I read it to my great embarrassment because it was sort of required reading. It was like, be here now, stranger to strange land, uh, those silly Carlos Castaneda books. We all read them. But uh, this had a big impact on Manson because it was about, this, well, I need to tell you the story. I don't even recommend you read it because I just, in fact, I'd rather you didn't. I don't want to be responsible. <laughs> but we all broke that. Pardon me? We all broke rock. That. All right. There's a man who read it. <laughs> that was a popular word. I'm told that that's actually in the dictionary now as an official yeah. word. Which one? Grok. You know, if you oh, rock yeah. somebody, it means a whole, it's sort of like deep understanding. Deep understanding, love, tolerance. Uh, I grok you, you know. Um, and so he, in, the, in the novel, the protagonist, who is a Martian, <laughs> with all these wonderful su superhuman powers and immensely wealthy started a church called the Church of All Worlds, I believe that was it. And they had a lot of different practices, among which was free sex. Uh, and they were patterned off a church that would existed in a sort of a totalitarian government. Uh, and the premise of that is if you don't follow what we say, then we are going to kill you. So Manson kind of was influenced by both of those. Incidentally, totally tangentially, it's an interesting thing when you study Manson or any subject, you go off on all these tangents that don't really fit into the PowerPoint. But I'm going to tell you this because we're in Berkeley, right? They're actually, <coughs> uh, based on the strange and a strange land, a neo-pagan religion which has uh, non-profit status in, the United, in California called the Church of All Worlds exists, and there is a Berkeley chapter of any of you are filling up a particular spiritual void. You know, you can probably find them. They have a website. I looked at it. I was. We have a meetup. Yeah, we can have a meetup. Maybe we could have a panel discussion. <laughs> so he was influenced by this book a lot because the free love stuff, uh, the kill your enemy stuff, uh, take over the world. The whole point was that by going on memory, which is decades old, and I didn't like the book the first time I read it, was that. Ultimately, the goal was to convert the whole world to the Church of All Worlds. He liked it. But of course, like any good cult member, not everyone, but more than I would like to, th I would care for, he was heavily influenced by the book of Revelation. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. The wonderful 
I'm going to go on another tang tangent here. Please excuse me. I'm, I'm Irish. I get to do that, right? Um, about 12 years ago, my Uncle Bill, who I really love dearly, was a sweet man. He became very, very, very religious. Uh, and, and I said just extemporaneously when I gave this talk for Sheldon's class some months ago, you know, I said, you know, it's like the Irish just turn to religion when they get old. But then I thought about it, and I thought, you know, that's a testable claim, because <laughs> I'm in my 60s now. You could actually track me. I'd be an in of one, uh, but we can find out. In any case, he was totally enamored of that book, and, um, and there were parts of it that he thought were particularly relevant to him. Uh, and this is the part that I really liked. Uh, you know, and uh, because he got this strange belief that out in the Mojave Desert, in Death Valley somewhere, there was a cave, a bottomless pit, that would take him down to an underground river, uh, and that's where he intended to take his followers eventually. And he identified with the pale horse. Its rider was named Death. And uh, let's see. Um, excuse me, it's not. It's kind of froze here on me. Just a moment. Tucker, I think we kind of. We should try escape if nothing else. Escape. That you could talk about. Oh, wow, you're brilliant. Thank you. And what was interesting is, I might have just given it away with that last clip, and I apologize for that. Um, so the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, I actually, when my uncle asked me, and well, I got on a sidetrack uh, when I was thinking about I could be an N of one, you could do a study on me to see if I become over religious as I get older. Unlikely, but possible. Anyway, uh, as a favor, once about 12 years ago, I called my Uncle Bill, who was a sweet guy, and he's much bigger than me. And uh, I always loved him, but I, I was always scared of him, too, And <laughs> as a kid. And, and I said, what would you like for Christmas this year, Uncle Bill? And usually, because he was a humble guy, he would ask for something really simple, a tie, uh, something that would cost $10 or, well, there was this paperback book I saw at the drugstore, maybe, you know, but one, I asked him about 12 years ago, and he said, Pat, I'd like you to read the Bible cover to cover. And, you know, and I did it because he was a good old man and, and I could have lied to him, but I didn't want to. And so I, I read it from cover to cover. It's, there's some parts of it that are pretty compelling. Bogged down a little in numbers in Deuteronomy, but pick up. But, you know, you pick up. But when I got to the book of Revelation, I read it and I didn't understand it. And, uh, big surprise, but I was surprised. Uh, so I got what I did in grad school. I got a notepad next to me. I sat down at my desk and I read it again and I took notes and I looked stuff up on the computer and I read it that time and I didn't understand it that time either. <laughs> but what's interesting, with Charles Manson with his second grade education, he understood it perfectly. And he even knew who the four horsemen of the apocalypse yep. were, yep. which of course were the Beatles. The Beatles. <laughs> hey, it stands obvious. to reason, it's right? And more interesting is he read it and he realized that according to the book of Revelation, which of course is without error, he was destined to be the fifth beetle. <laughs> and then the fifth angel blew his trumpet and I, and I saw one who was fallen to earth from heaven. I can read the rest of it. And, he was, well, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. That's kind of where he got that, the nucleus, you know, the of his idea that out in the desert there was a bottomless pit. So you might just want to pause to think about the Beatles. Uh, I was actually a Rolling Stones person who kind of divided into two categories when I was a teenager. Uh, but anyway, I knew the Beatles, who they were, but you might just want to pause and think about Paul McCartney, John Lennon, and Charles Manson sitting together to compose a song. It's, a, it's an image that I can't quite pull into focus. And he decided that the White Album was actually an album that the Beatles had done in which they were communicating directly with him. And so Bungalow Bill, if you remember that song, Who Did You Kill, Bungalow Bill, because Manson grew up in the prison system, you'd be hard pressed to find a more racist society in America than the prison system in the, in the United States. And he was a racist. Uh, 
he believed there was going to be an armed conflict between the blacks and the whites, even though the blacks are outnumbered 10 to 1, they were going to win. Mm -hmm. um, however, because he was a racist, he didn't believe that the black people were smart enough to govern the United States, and so he figured he would hide out in his bottomless pit with his army of young love, as he called them, and then once they realized they couldn't run the government, they would contact him and he would be the king of the United States, or the leader of the United States. Kind of bizarre, while my guitar gently weeps. Incidentally, he pedaled, to try to pedal his songs, and nobody wanted them, by the way. Just for the record, he had 150 plus, nobody wanted them. And uh, his two favorite musicians, interestingly, were not Mick Jagger or John Lennon. They were Frankie Lane and Dean Martin. <laughs> he was a product of his era. Happiness is a warm gun. Uh, Susan Atkins, one of his followers, her nickname was Sa uh, Sadie. So, of course, Sexy Sadie, written about Susan Atkins. Revolution, of course, Piggies, that's a euphemism for police. Blackbird, uh, that's uh, African Americans. And Helter Skelter. Helter Skelter was really the prophetic song that the Beatles wrote, according to Charles Manson, that uh, predicted the, would predicted the upcoming race war. Actually, I saw Paul McCartney last, I guess, when it's September in Candlestick Park, and he did this song, and I never for one minute thought he was talking about Revelation. He was actually <laughs> talking about a, a slide at an amusement park. You get at the top, you come down. But I remember doing a presentation to undergraduates, and it's not this one, this one continues to evolve. And I played this song, and not one of the undergraduates had ever heard it. Really? But we might actually give it a minute, uh, if the La Pena people don't mind. Um, yeah. yeah, go for it. Yeah, I, I, and I want to point out that I was a Rolling Stones person, but one of my closest friends, Bill, not my Uncle Bill, uh, he just listened to Christian music, but <clears throat> he was a Beatles person. I always bought the Stones album as soon as it came out. They were, what, 388 at Payless, I think. It was a great deal. Uh, and he always bought the Beatles, and so when he bought the Beatles double album, I went over and we listened to it in his room. And when I played this, this song, it really troubled me. And I said, that's really a strange song, Bill. And he goes, Pat, I've been telling you, that's the Beatles. You've got to give the Beatles a chance. Yes, yes, sir. Do you know where the volume control is? No. Nope. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're in the mercy of the gods now, Tucker. I won't play it long. Yeah, that's a, that's great. Uh, there's the words. You can read the words. It is kind of a scary sounding song, but it's really written about an amusement park slide. It's a benign song, uh, and I'm quite comfortable sure that Sexy Sadie was not written about Susan Atkins either. But he had this vision that he was going to become the fifth Beatle. That would give him an immense amount of influence over the young people. Remember, this is the height of the hippie era. There were literally tens of thousands of young people on the roads. That's not an exaggeration. When I say you could have seen 200 hitchhikers between San Francisco and, and the Oregon border, I'm not exaggerating, they were everywhere. And he thought he'd become a rock star, the fifth would have all this money, all this power, they'd give him, the, he'd give him enough money to survive Helter Skelter, the race war that was coming up, and he was gonna be ruler of America. And he continued to write songs, and, um, and he had his family singing back up on him. It occurs to me that there might be one or two people in here who have never actually heard Charlie Manson sing one of his songs. Is that possible? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, well, let's listen to one. How's that? Well, we're going to listen to as much of it as I can stand, and I'm going to be the arbiter on that, okay? <laughs> I am a mechanical man. A mechanical man, and I do the best I can because I have my family. Oh. I am a mechanical boy. I am my mother's toy. And I play in the backyard sometimes. I am a mechanical boy. All right, and that's as much as I can stand. <laughs> But we're not done. We're going to hear some more of his music before. Oh, no, Charlie, don't worry. I, I saw the, the disappointment in your face. <laughs> but the problem was he had all this happen. The Beatles were writing songs about him. He was supposed to be the fifth Beatle. He had all these wonderful songs that were going to turn on all of the young America. But he wasn't getting anywhere. 
Uh, nobody wanted to hear his songs. He, um, then he got a break because uh, one of his followers, Patricia Quinwinkle, was hitchhiking and she got picked up by a multimillionaire driving a Ferrari. And, um, and he took her back to his house where they had sex. And then he left to do something. And so while he was gone, she called Charlie Manson, who was staying at the Spawn Ranch, but I'll elaborate on in a minute. And she said, you got to get over here, Charlie. This was destiny. So Charlie got the family. They hurried over there. And that multimillionaire was actually uh, Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Dennis Wilson pulled up in his mansion in Bel Air. He looked through his huge picture window and saw the house full of people. Uh, he sure had totally forgotten about Kate Krenwinkel probably five minutes after he left her there. And Charlie saw him, he got out and he walked over to him, kind of an imposing figure even though he's about this tall. And, and uh, Dennis Wilson said something like, you're not gonna hurt me, are you? And then Charlie got down on his hands and knees and washed Dennis Wilson's feet. And that's all Dennis Wilson really needed, you know, because this was during uh, Dennis Wilson's Maharishi days. He was big peace and love, you know, spirituality of the max. And he decided that Manson was a genius. Uh, and he, Manson, they went back into his house. They had a big orgy. Manson played his music. Dennis Wilson loved the music. And he said, you know, I can get you a record contract. And of course, how much better... What else could he ask? There was Dennis Wilson. Tragically, he was a great musician. He drowned uh, some years back, fell off his sailboat while he was high. Um, and so he did. And so he introduced him to uh, a record producer who was a big shot record producer, produced a lot of the big band, Los Angeles bands. I'm going on memory now, which is fallible, but I think he might have produced The Doors. He did produce The Beach Boys and produced The Birds. And as I say, when you're starting to research something like this, you go off on all these tangents, and the next slide has no relevance. I just find the incongruity so odd that I put it on there because Terry Melcher was actually the son of Doris Day. <laughs> I mean, so you got to contrast Doris Day, who epitomized purity, with Charles Manson. Okay, that's <laughs> totally irrelevant, but I was impressed by it. Anyway, uh, the other Beach Boys were not particularly enamored of Charles Manson, <laughs> but they bought some of his songs anyway. And uh, interestingly, they recorded one of his songs on their album. Uh, it was called Never Learn Not to Love. Now, when they recorded it, uh, they did not give Charles Manson uh, uh, music uh, credit for having written the song, but they did pay him something. But he wasn't happy with the song because they changed a lot of the lyrics. And they also changed the title um, because the Beach Boys, being professional musicians, multimillionaires, they decided that their title, Never Learn Not to Love, was a much better title than Charles Manson's title, which was Cease to Exist Girl. <laughs> but I thought, let's watch the Beach Boys do Charles Manson's song on national television. Mike Douglas show for those of my age. You'll have to forgive us, we're in an awful time bind, and if we start talking, we're not going to be able to hear any more music, and boy, that's what we want. Okay, how are things in California? Warm and wet. Uh -huh. They say it's fashionable to say to a California, have you moved lately? And many of them have, without wanting to. Uh, no problem, may we hear, what are you going to do for us now, fellas? Never learned how to love. Is this the acapella thing? Not, not, to, to, love. Love. Never not to love. The next one's the acapella then. Yeah. Okay. Ne
say it goes on like that for a long time. I'm a big Beach Boys fan. I saw them a couple years ago when they played the Duke Theory. Not one of their best songs. But they, <clears throat> interestingly, as Manson's family continued to grow, they really didn't have any income to speak of except some dealing and stealing. And, and he tried to prostitute the girls out. It was a little hard because they were essentially, uh, he tried to get them jobs as topless dancers, but they were too young, actually, to meet the physical criteria. But he found out that he could actually feed his family quite nicely by just raiding the trash bins behind big supermarkets. And, uh, and there's a wonderful little uh, vignette where they borrowed Dennis Wilson's Rolls Royce. And so you can picture these teenage girls, such as these, um, that squeaky from <coughs> on the far left, uh, Mary Bruner, second to, uh, second to right. Uh, anyway, and they borrowed the Rolls Royce. And so, I mean, these images are just so striking to me. So you can picture this Rolls Royce pulling up behind like a Safeway store. These three or four teenage girls in cut-off shorts getting out, getting into the trash bin and filling up the front of the Rolls Royce with uh, damaged produce. But he loved it and uh, because it was a wonderful way to feed a lot of people for no money. And interestingly enough, he was inspired to write a song about it. So Charlie, I know you were impatient. And this is oh, garbage dump. Oh, garbage dump. Why you call a garbage dump? Oh, garbage dump. Oh, garbage dump. Why? Oh, right, it goes on a long time. I don't need to play anymore. It already did. Pardon me. It already did go on. It went on too long. But anyway, let's talk about his techniques of control. There's some absurdity in this, but the fact was he was manipulating and controlling and doing great damage to children. 